this church, Our Lady Queen of Angels, is a sanctuary church, part of the more than uh, 600 churches and universities and synagogues throughout the country who have committed to give refuge to uh, people who flee the country uh, due to persecution. And so we get, we continue to get a large number of people uh, coming in, uh, seeking uh, refuge. Uh, we have their testimonies, we have files on these people, we attempt to verify their stories. And so from my own personal experience, uh, uh, I know that we are almost at the 1980 levels of persecution, repression, uh, and uh, violence in Central America, specifically in, in El Salvador. I met Father Luis Oliveras through my friend Dr. Dan Hinsley, who volunteers at the Oscar Romero Clinic for Salvadoran Refugees in Los Angeles. It's run by an organization called El Rescate. My interest in El Salvador, I guess, began with my youngest sister, Nicole, who was adopted from an orphanage in El Salvador when she was 10 months old and weighed 8 pounds. One day I approached Dan about doing a piece on the clinica. Soon after that, he called me in San Diego with a story of a woman who had just arrived in Los Angeles from El Salvador. He said that I just had to hear her story. I thought that I had a pretty good understanding of what was going on in El Salvador, but I was completely unprepared for Marta and the events that brought her to the United States. La razón de salir de mi país es por seguridad de mi vida, corría peligro en mi vida. Ya había sido golpeada, maltratada y amenazada. Y pues, por suerte o milagro de Dios, no me mataron. Y pues no me quedaba otra alternativa nada más que salirme del país a como diera lugar. Ignorando la situación que traía también ya dentro de mí, porque no sabía que yo había quedado embarazada del, del, de las veces que de cuando me tuvieron, este, como se llama, secuestrada. No sabía que, que yo estaba embarazada. Hasta cuando estaba en México yo me di cuenta de eso. Y para mí fue un, un, una tragedia o quizás lo peor que me pudo haber, me puede pasar. ¿no? Y salimos, eh, eh, tuve que salir de noche a dormir, este, ¿cómo se llama? En una terminal de, de, de buses, de los buses que salen para Guatemala. Y de allí nos venimos en ese bus hasta Tapachula y a México. Y, y de allí en otro a, al propio México. Y, y ahí pasamos pues varios días porque al llegar ahí a Tijuana no nos podían, no nos dejaban pasar para acá. Llegamos ahí y ahí la mira nos sacaba carreras para, para allá. ¿no? Entonces este, pasamos sin dormir, sin comer y, y ahí pues vigilando la hora en que en que ellos se descuidaran para poder pasar y cuando al fin pudimos pasar de ahí llegamos caminando a San Diego de, de ahí de, de as indicated by a recent survey of the LA Times, uh, the refugee is not welcome in this country. And in general, the immigrant is not welcome in this country at the present time. There is an anti-immigrant feeling, or mood, or attitude in this country. Uh, I think that particular scenario of a hostile atmosphere uh, makes for a situation which, if the Salvadorian could go back, they would. Because it's impossible to get a job. The immigration law makes it illegal for someone to hire an undocumented person with very heavy sanctions. So it's almost impossible to get a job. The only jobs these people can get is by standing in a corner, begging for someone to give them a day's work with the possibility of getting $25, $30, $40 for their work for that day. That's, that's the reality in which these people exist. 
I wonder how my sister Nicole's life would have been had she stayed in El Salvador. She is now a bright, beautiful, and very funny 12-year-old. Would she or I ever understand the enormity of it all without spending an extended period of time in El Salvador? Soon after I completed the interviews, Mary Allison, a nurse and my translator with Marta, called me with an incredible invitation. Did I want to go to El Salvador as part of the reception committee for the caravan to El Salvador that was to deliver medicine and supplies to the needy? I had two weeks to get a visa, come up with the money for video equipment and travel, and convince my parents that I wasn't going to be killed in that country's civil war. The trip to El Salvador was long but uneventful. When we arrived in San Salvador, we had been up for 40 hours. My parents had spent a month in El Salvador in 1979 at the start of the Civil War when they were adopting Nicole. The timing of our trip was particularly interesting because we were in El Salvador in time for the national elections when major changes would be occurring in the country. It was also a very dangerous time to be in the country. We found out upon arrival that there was only 40% of the normal electricity in the city due to attacks on the lines, and water was on and off. I was especially concerned about the electricity I would need to charge my video camera. Also, as of midnight, there would be no transportation due to a strike organized by the FMLN to try and disrupt the elections. If the delegation was to go anywhere, it would have to be on foot. One of the first places we visited in El Salvador was the National University. We reached by an hour's walk from our hotel, and it was a very warm and humid day. Before we could enter the university, both our bags and our bodies were searched thoroughly. The most obvious difference between American campuses and the campus in San Salvador is the presence of barbed wire. The university is still suffering from the effects of the 1985 earthquake. Many buildings are still damaged, equipment is broken or bent, and the rubble still remains in some places. Despite all the difficulties, education still takes place, and the university's printing press has still put out materials. The resiliency of the Salvadoran people is amazing, and again and again I thought about Marta and what she went through and survived. Bueno, yo soñaba con ser una profesional, ¿no? con sacar una carrera, y es más, escogí una carrera que yo decía que le iba a ayudar a mucha gente con problemas eh, mentales, porque debido a la guerra, ya se vive una psicosis bien terrible de guerra, ¿no? Entonces mi, mi idea siempre fue querer ayudar a los demás. Ahí pues uno tiene que colaborar porque el, el mismo dolor de lo que pasa alrededor de uno lo obliga. ¿no? Y el hecho de ser estudiante ya es delito, ya es ser un guerrillero. ¿sí? Y entonces sí, tenía problemas incluso ya de última tarea en mi trabajo. Porque eh, a veces veía que me perseguían y tal vez porque caminaba más rápido o iba más gente, nunca antes me pasó nada. The primary reason why people from Central America are coming in, the numbers that they're coming in, is primarily for reasons of persecution. The, the violence in the home country is uh, uh, at the uh, the levels which they simply cannot uh, risk their lives any longer, and uh, it's that polarized, and it's affecting the church, where we have, in effect, a divided Catholic church. Those who have chosen to identify with the poor, who have uh, made a clear option to identify with the people who are suffering, uh, have a tendency to be identified as communists, even by their own church people. Our next visit was to Finastras, the Salvadoran Labor Union Federation. They served us a lunch of chicken and spaghetti without silverware. I think that's what the tortillas were supposed to be for. A young man from New York who was spending a year volunteering with the Salvadoran trade unions served as our translator. The members of Finastras were open and warm, and it was amazing that they did so much work against the insurmountable odd. Cuando fue dinamitado el local, cuando estaba ubicado sobre hoy la Juan Pablo II, donde fue destruido y cateado totalmente el local sindical. Um, we have the case of when our a previous office at the Federation had on the uh, main street here, Juan Pablo II, was um, bombed and completely destroyed and then ransacked by the uh, military. And from there, they, they took many uh, of our documents. 
los desaparecimientos de bastantes compañeros dirigentes de FENASTRA y de los sindicatos más consecuentes. And from there, from the information they gathered, they uh, identified people and it resulted in disappearance. We also learned that FENASTRA was boycotting the elections and the consequences that that could carry for them. <laughs> So at a military checkpoint, um, they'll ask for my schedule, they'll ask for my identification before. And so when first of all, this my booklet is in stamp, they'll start interrogating me. Well, why didn't you go out and vote? In toda esa interrogación e investigación, pues sí, van a dar cuenta, se van a dar cuenta quién es el, a la persona que tienen detenido. And through the, so that not having a stamp sparks an investigation. Little by little, they start to understand and realize who exactly the person is. Y ahí es donde comienzan muchos desaparecidos y asesinados también. And from there leads to what, what becomes many assassinations and disappearances. Ahora, este, el gobierno usa todos los métodos posibles para poder este, presentar internacionalmente de que la gente o el pueblo acude a las urnas. So right now the government is doing everything possible uh, in terms of their international uh, propaganda to say that yes, the, the people of El Salvador are um, going to uh, go out and vote in the elections. Wednesday evening we went to a political rally for La Convergencia, a new coalition party. There was a surprising lack of military visible, although one could really feel their presence. Ruben Zamora and other influential leaders of La Convergencia had previously fled El Salvador because of the threats on their lives. Now they had chosen to return to participate in this election. The days before the election were very tense. The military had taken to driving people in trucks due to the transportation strike. The mood on the streets changed constantly and the nights were filled with the sound of helicopters and machine gun fire. I'd been warned by the U.S. Embassy not to take pictures of the military, but the reporter and me took over, and I was concerned that if we were found out, I could jeopardize the whole group, although they all supported our actions when we informed them. My heart was pounding and my hands were shaking when I taped the arrest of the man outside the hotel. When I look back on the footage now, it amazes me how everything seems so exaggerated. I reflect, too, on the general sense of fear that had taken over the country. I also wondered how people like Marta had the courage to become politically involved. Yo este, colaboraba con, eh, allí en la universidad, en la, universidad, en la UNTS, ¿no? pero nosotros nos dedicábamos porque las señoras madres de los, de los hijos desaparecidos, de reos políticos, ellas son señoras muy humildes, eh, por la mayoría campesinas que todo lo ignoran, algunas no saben ni leer, eh, entonces uno tiene que, que coordinarlas, enseñarles, ella su dolor a veces de haber perdido a un hijo, quieren arreglar las cosas, este en una forma espontánea, gritando, tal vez con misterismo, algo así, y uno tiene que encargarse de, de explicarles que es otra forma la que tenemos que utilizar. Las Comadres is an organization whose name stands for Mothers of the Disappeared and Murdered in El Salvador. This is a group very much like the one Marta worked for when she herself was kidnapped and tortured. There was initial concern for safety since the military had surrounded the UNTS building, another support organization only a block away. We decided that our presence could only be a source of protection for the mothers. Las Comadres also helps with medical attention to those who need it, as well as in getting political prisoners released and in trying to find and publicize the cases of those disappeared for political reasons by the Salvadoran government or the right-wing death squads. We met with some of the members of Las Comadres, and their stories echoed those of martyrs and the ones told to me by Father Olivares in Los Angeles. Okay.
as the leader of that particular party. The candidate that they have placed for election, or, uh, for, as a candidate for the presidency for the coming elections, apparently is a basically a good man, but he is part of that oligarchy. He is part of those wealthy landowners in El Salvador. Uh, uh, and he is definitely a very, very wealthy man. Cristiani is his name. And everybody assumes that he will be elected president. Uh, so we have a difficult situation now. The Arena Party uh, was in power when Archbishop Oscar Romero was killed. Uh, Mr. Dombazar has been directly connected with uh, the assassination orders uh, of uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero. Uh, there is no question that the level of violence under the Arena regime was, was uh, uh, much, much higher than it has been in the recent past few years. Now that the Arena party apparently is coming back into power, there is a resurgence of violence, there is a resurgence of violations of human rights. Uh, we are finding more and more uh, bodies strewn on the roads uh, like it used to be back in the 1980s, 81s of, uh, of the history of El Salvador. Y mi hija se me entraron a la casa a medianoche y, y fue cuando me agarraron y me llevaron y cuando me llevaron al vehículo donde me llevaban y, y ya llevaban mis compañeras más, compañeras mías. Luego nos llevaron a una casa encerrada que no sabría decir dónde porque nos vendaron cubierta de los, de los ojos y al llegar ahí comenzaron a, a, a golpearnos y yo a un compañero que el compañero pues luego antes que nosotros a él lo asesinaron ahí y a nosotros comenzaron a interrogarnos y luego nos decían que lo que querían era información de nosotros de que les dijéramos dónde se ocupaban ciertas personas que nosotros no sabíamos y que si no lo hacíamos que nos iban a golpear bueno, nos golpeaban pero la, la verdad es que nos decían que no nos iban a hacer daño de, de matarnos ni nada pero sí a mis tres compañeras las asesinaron y a mí también me iban a asesinar, pero este, hubo alguien que ayudó a que, a que yo escapara. Y así es como yo puedo estar acá. 
pero sí fui violada, golpeada y maltratada y bueno, qué decirle yo todo lo que puede ser se le de daño a uno. That night I hardly slept at all, and again the electricity was gone from the city. We learned that the caravan we had been there to meet had been held up at the border for days now. We stayed up until late at night with David singing songs from all over Latin America. David now lives in Washington, D.C., and was risking his life just by being in El Salvador. <laughs> The next day, again on foot, through the streets of San Salvador. It's been years since the earthquake of 1985, but as in other parts of the city, the evidence of the damage still remains. It seems that clearing up after disaster is not a priority compared to just staying alive. One of the organizations that helps the victim of the earthquake is UNADES, an international group, and it does work independent of the government. Pharmaceutical companies from the U.S. and other countries donate supplies of medicines, but these are usually out of date before they even arrive in El Salvador. The people of UNADES are working with absolutely the bare minimum of supplies. They themselves have almost nothing, and yet they continue to give and give. They were very excited about the coming of the caravan and were especially looking forward to the promised medical supplies. It was hard to tell them that the caravan had been held up at the border and that to date there were no assurances that they would make it across, despite continued pleas to the Salvadoran government and the U.S. Embassy. A group decided to drive up to the Guatemalan border to visit the caravan. We loaded up a van with food and water for the caravan members and set off. The countryside was beautiful, rolling hills, mountains, all types of trees and flowers. It took about two and a half hours, the last half hour over terrible roads. When we reached La Frontera, the caravan members were very glad to see us. After a minimum of red tape, we were allowed to cross over to the caravan carrying our food and water. The 15 trucks and van were parked under the shade of some trees. The caravan members had been living in them for the week that they were not allowed to cross the border. We only have about a half an hour, so if we can kind of make it somewhat of a semi-circle in this area. <laughs> and then, what we said that the last word uh, belonged to President Duarte, and he never answered anything. So that thing felt, uh, did not materialize. And we have heard the different scenarios. You know, we have the one, the worst scenario is that you will not allow in. Some of the members had started a hunger strike to focus attention on their situation, and it was very difficult to tell them that no one in official circles seemed to care. They had driven over 4,000 miles to take medicine and supplies and donate their own vehicles to the people of El Salvador, but it seemed they were not going to be able to complete their mission. There was a lot of hugging again when we left. Our presence had done much to revive their spirits, even if our news did not. Back in San Salvador, we spent a good amount of time visiting the various communities within the city. The first community we visited was La Soledad, up in the foothills overlooking San Salvador. Many times, entire villages from the outlying areas would move together into the city to escape the fighting. These villages would set up communities inside the city or in the outlying areas. Much of the residential areas of San Salvador are broken up into these small base communities. La Soledad is unique for many reasons, but the most obvious is its location, right in the middle of a garbage dump. La Soledad has been in place for 40 years. It seems that all the buildings and the structures are made from recycled materials. 
In fact, many of its residents eke out a living by sorting and salvaging the garbage from the dump. We were welcomed into their meeting hall to discuss their conditions. We found out that the owner of this land had just died and the consequences it would have for their community. So now, after 40 years, the people of La Soledad have to fight for the right to live and their livelihood in a garbage dump. La Soledad was one end of the extremes in terms of the communities. Many of them had strong leadership and organization. They were clean and had specific roles for disposal of waste and garbage. Many had meeting halls where social events such as plays and readings were held, in addition to classes on health care and other topics. The nurses in our group who had come to El Salvador to distribute the medical aid from the caravan that might never arrive, went around to the different communities and held small clinics for the people. They worked with a wonderful woman named Mary who was living in El Salvador for a year along with her husband, Pat. Mary went from community to community holding clinics and trying to teach some of the women to do basic first aid and medical evaluations. Pat worked with the children setting up schools and classes in the communities. When a clinic was held, the people would wait in line to see the nurses with problems ranging from pregnancy to worms to chicken pox. Something that was very different from the U.S. was that no matter how long the people had to wait or how hot it was, no one ever complained. In all of the communities, there was always evidence of self-sufficiency, such as these shoemakers who took pride in making a high quality and necessary product without the help of industrial machinery. It always made an impact when the people there, despite their great need, would bring out sodas or fruit juices or even offer to feed our entire group. That day, women were returning from a scavenging mission loaded with old mattresses, pieces of wood, corrugated tin, and other throwaway items that they would use to build or outfit their homes. The sense of family and community was evident in the places we visited in El Salvador, very much a sense of we that is so different from the United States. Eventually, we returned to the border, having gotten word that the government would allow in the trucks and the vans from the caravan, but not the people driving them. When volunteers were asked to drive vans back, many in our group decided to stay in the city and accomplish other things. So the organizers took up the slack with local people. It was many hours before the officials processed the necessary paperwork, checked the vehicles, and sent us on our way. The drive home turned out to be my biggest adventure on the trip. I was assigned to drive an old Dodge van with a wicked right hook in the steering and Mickey Mouse carpeting in the back. We were told that we had to stay together on the drive, and this proved to be a challenge as there were over 12 vehicles in the caravan. We were also told that it would take from a few weeks to many months before the vehicles were released by San Salvador Customs, if they were released at all. Shortly before our leaving the country, the people of El Salvador were observing Easter. By then we had found out that the Arena Party, the right-wing party, had won the presidential elections. There were celebrations for Good Friday in front of the cathedral. Artists created elaborate paintings on the street out of colored sand, such as this one of the Virgin of Guadalupe. The extent of the faith of the Salvadoran people really impressed me, as well as the strength they so clearly derive from it. I thought long and hard about the impact of poverty and the war on everyday people in El Salvador and in the U.S. People that I knew, including my own sister Nicole and Marta. Back in Los Angeles, one part of Marta's story had come to an end. She had given birth to her baby as a refugee in a foreign land. Sí, le digo en la carta lo que pasó, cómo ella fue concebida, y también de que no no tengo nada en contra de ella, pues es hija mía, pero que yo no la podía tener conmigo porque tengo pues la responsabilidad de mi madre y de mi otra niña. Y este mi país es un problema, no no puede ella vivir ahí. That fact that the United States is responsible gives us a reason why the United States will not recognize the Salvadorian, Guatemalan, uh, Honduran people as political refugees. Because what are they saying? They are refugees from a situation we have created. 
So they can't, and, and that's precisely the reason why they say they insist that they are economic refugees. I mean, that's very fundamental. But it's also the reason why the Immigration Service is so hell-bent on destroying the sanctuary movement. Because what the sanctuary movement says uh, very clearly is that we are here not only to give refuge to the political people who flee the country for some persecution, we're also here as a sign of or a strong voice saying to the United States, you are responsible for this. And if you want this to stop, then stop funding the war. Oh, uh -huh.